Our scripture this morning comes from both Micah and from the Gospel of Matthew. Micah chapter 3, verses 5 through 12. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray, who cry peace when they have something to eat, but declare war against those who put nothing into their mouths. Therefore it shall be night to you without vision and darkness to you without revelation. The sun shall go down on the prophets and the day shall be black over them. The seers shall be disgraced and the diviners put to shame. They shall all cover their lips for there is no answer from God. But as for me, I am filled with power with the spirit of the Lord and with justice and might to declare Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Hear this, you rulers of the house of Jacob and chiefs of the house of Israel who abhor justice and pervert all equity, who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with wrong. Its rulers give judgment for a bribe. The priests teach for a price. Its prophets give oracles for money. Yet they lean upon the Lord and say, Surely the Lord is with us. No harm shall come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall be a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the house a wooded height. And from Matthew, chapter 23, verses 1 through 12. Jesus said to the crowd and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it. But do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the shoulders of others, but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. They love to have the place of honor at banquets and the best seats in synagogues, and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have people call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all students. And call no one your father on earth, for you have one father, the one in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. All who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. Please pray with me. God, you have given us eyes to see and ears to hear. We have the capacity to know what is true around us. When people around us have put their trust in us, guide us to tell the truth and speak up, even when truth is against our own interests. Show us when we are ungodly people and when we have ignored your guidance. Give us hope for all who seek you. May we be led before your presence. God, we are thankful that we have been taught by many faithful leaders and live in the words of your, your book to live tr lives truly worthy of you. God, call us to follow your word into glory and grace. God, remind us that we can hear truth from those who do not practice what they teach, yet show us that truth and help us to stand up and serve those 
as well as lead. Give us leaders who are humble and full of grace. As disciples of Jesus and prophets of God, may our lives reflect the justice and mercy that have always been in the stories we have heard from you. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I decided to read from both the prophet Micah and from Matthew because they both speak to leadership. They both speak to, I think, a kind of everyday leadership that we all carry, some kinds of authority with people in our lives. It doesn't matter who you are, somebody is watching you to know how to live a life of faith, to know how to live a role in a family. Somebody's watching you. And I think these texts from Micah and Matthew fit very well, not only in sort of official religious leader type situations, but, every, but other places as well. And both of them are cautions, warnings, against the abuse of leaders who teach one way of living and perhaps live in another secretly or behind closed doors, ways that benefit themselves. Now, most people don't always do exactly the right thing. All of us have those times when we don't live up to our own ideals, the way we teach. Most people at least attempt to live in ways that are consistent with what we say and we believe. And I think it's easier to be content and perhaps happy if we aren't at war with ourselves that way. And perhaps as we age, that becomes easier because we know ourselves better and we know what we believe. But I think it's easier to be content, but it's important for those things to come together, to practice what you preach, as they say, to live what you teach. Now, over the past few weeks, we've been talking about Moses' story, and I think that's important. But this day, we enter into Matthew's gospel again. And up to this point, in this segment of Matthew's gospel, Jesus hasn't been winning friends among his people's religious leaders since he rode into Jerusalem. I believe it's chapter 21. This is the final section of Matthew's gospel and it leads to Jesus' crucifixion. We're at the end set of stories. So he rides in on a donkey in a counter demonstration to Rome's demonstration of military prowess. And then shortly thereafter, Jesus cleaned the temple of its money changers and dove sellers. And that upset those who thought those things were very important. Then he teaches a series of lessons and parables that are meant to reveal how God's present and coming kingdom or community aren't going to be business as usual, aren't going to make it comfortable for those who are already comfortable. The community of God that Jesus is talking about, ushering in, is meant to upend comfortable lives and comfort the lives of those who were in poverty and chaos. And so the sort of opponents that are here in the gospel are the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the scribes. And they weren't evil. Sometimes we get that idea because of the way that they are described in the gospels, the arguments that Jesus gets in. They were just the comfortable religious folks like us who were in church or synagogue every week just trying to be just trying to be faithful and not stir up too much trouble Jesus had been telling parables though about how what they were doing was not enough that they were not helping the poor enough that they were possibly even creating burdens for the poor that they could never live up to because they didn't have the resources they needed to do some of the things that the Pharisees did. He pointed out that the laws they kept were the laws that made them look good 
and the laws that they broke pushed their community toward injustice. The laws they broke took away mercy And they ignored those places where God said, I'm standing with the poor. Like Micah, he directed them to see that leaders who enriched themselves at the cost of anyone that they led weren't just mistaken. They couldn't be obedient to the Torah, the way of life that God had called them to live. In these situations, Jesus had called them to see that paying taxes to Rome with Roman coins wasn't the problem they should have with Rome being in, the, in Jerusalem. The problem they should have with Rome is that Rome claimed their lives. That Rome's corrupting influence drew them away from God in whose image they were made. And when Jesus was asked about the ways they differed in interpreting life and eternal life and death, Jesus pointed out that God was the God of those who were living right now. After so much back and forth with the Sadducees, the scribes, and the Pharisees, groups that made up the governing council in the temple, it seems Jesus has decided to be more direct with them here. He didn't argue with the things that the Pharisees taught, because they taught Torah, they taught the Bible and the writings. That which was written was not the problem. Jesus did, however, disagree with the ostentatious piety of the Pharisees and how they equated showy faith with sincere faith and trusting in God. The Pharisees demonstrated how to look religious but weren't necessarily the most sincere leaders in their faith. One commentator compares Jesus' words to that of the late Molly Ivins, who described people who want to be Texans but aren't as they're all hat and no cattle. They looked faithful, but had secrets. The Pharisees, as Jesus see them, are all robe and title, fringes and phylacteries, and have forgotten the heart of the law, the heart of God. Now, I'm sure we're aware because there are examples in the Gospels about those who were faithful, about those who understood what the law required of them, about those who knew how to be faithful to God. It didn't fit everyone, but they all enjoyed the privilege of being in that exalted state. The privilege of being Pharisees, the privilege of being educated in the law, probably the privilege of being able to read, being able to afford because they were kind of in a line of power, those long fringes and broad phylacteries. Phylacteries are the boxes that they wear when they pray. They had recognition from their seats of power within the Sanhedrin, and that recognition connected them to the power of Rome. Matthew spends time here criticizing the hypocrisy and pride of the religious leaders of Jesus' time. This chapter continues with a series of woes or curses to leaders who per perpetrate the neglect or persecution of those they lead, being more concerned about status and title than caring for those they serve. He criticizes their practices creating rules to keep folks away and their practice of making converts to their practices who will then condemn the less stringent ways that other people worship, those who are faithful. The condemnation is that they practiced with vigor and they wanted to impose their decisions and their lifestyle on other people. The Pharisees were easily sincere in their practices, but that's not really the argument Jesus is having. Jesus is having the argument that they were imposing what they believed on people who lived more simply and worshiped within their means, who did what they could with the means and the time that they had. 
In another story, when Jesus praises the widow who gave a penny and criticized the Pharisees and the other wealthy people who dropped in heavy coins, it's a criticism of the meaning of generosity amid wealth and the privileges of wealth. So that's kind of the world that Jesus is talking about in here. And it's important to understand that Jesus wasn't criticizing people of another faith. He's criticizing people of his faith. He wasn't saying your religion is wrong and mine is right either. He was saying that they could all be more faithful to Torah, to the law, by reading it with their eye on love for God and neighbor. The teacher, Thomas Long, calls this argument a family feud. When Jesus finds fault with the Jewish leaders, he does so as a Jewish man, as a prophet like Isaiah or Jeremiah or Micah, as the case may be, whose strong words denounce Israel as spoken from within. Jesus and Micah both saw leadership within their own people and faith falling short of how God had called them to live in relationship with each other. Jesus saw and Micah saw people not taking into account how they shared resources with each other, how they treated each other, and how they lived about what was important in their lives. And it seems neither was afraid to mince words about what they said. Micah called down judgment on well-fed prophets on, or preachers who promoted peace and order and caused war on those who were hungry or needy, those who might have been demonstrating or protesting or marching for bread and for life. He saw, like Jesus did generations later, that preachers or teachers or prophets, leaders of any kind, those who ignored what was right in front of them would no longer be able to see the truth no longer be able to hear God's word because they neglected the truth. Micah even says that when they cannot see, speak, or hear truth, he will be filled with the power and spirit of God. Micah himself. If you don't use what you have correctly, somebody else will be given the power to do it. He criticized prophets for putting money and profit ahead of truth, of putting personal power they might gain ahead of the kind of relationship God demands between people. He criticized their willingness to say that the end justifies the means because the way that you get there determines where you're going. God's will isn't a just society without, it isn't just a society without violent acts. It's not peace imposed upon people it's peace because basic needs, equitable justice, and widespread practices of mercy are common among the people. As I was reading this text, I was reminded of the center story of Les Miserables. And that center story is a very simple story in spite of the length and complexity of the book. The story itself that's important is told through a man named Jean who stole a loaf of bread because his sister and her family didn't have enough to eat. He was found guilty of theft and sentenced to seven years. And because he tried to escape, his sentence was extended. At the end of his 20 years of hard labor, he was embittered, angry, and violent. To compound that anger, at that time in France, where the story is told, because he was on parole, he had to carry a yellow passport that declared him a convict at all times. So if he told the truth about who he was, he couldn't get a job that paid him enough to live. And if he lied about it, they would find out and fire him. So he decided to steal silver candlesticks from the house of a bishop where he, he was given a night to sleep and a meal, and when he was caught escaping with the candlesticks, the bishop said, in the song at least, I'm buying your soul with this silver. 
He gave him a chance to turn his life around, to use the wealth that he would gain from those incredible candlesticks that are praised at length. So he began to lie about who he was. And with the wealth of the silver, he became an important man. Even though he had paid triple for his crime, already the legal system gave him a burden, but didn't lift a finger to help. That's the main story in that book, which takes me a paragraph and Victor Hugo about a thousand pages. But the idea is that Hugo is trying to lift up how law and grace work and that they could work together, but they don't in this case. That injustice is an unbearable burden on society and that grace is necessary for society to function. Sometimes we talk about law as if it were such a burden, but God's gift of Torah to the people of Israel was one of the ways that God called upon human beings to be just and equitable to each other. And through that justice to be faithful and worshipful to God's own self. Jesus, speaking from his, within his Jewish faith, saw how people could abuse the tenets of the faith and end up abusing the very people that God had always sought to strengthen and protect. Jesus knew that the law wasn't the problem in itself. He upheld the knowledge of the law carried by the scribes and the Pharisees. The problem is the ways in which law and order in any age is used to abuse instead of build. The kind of changes Micah and Jesus weren't call, were calling for weren't just personal changes in the ways that people treat one another or see one another. Those are important. It's important that we have compassion for those we see, those whose stories we hear. But it's vital that we see those folks and those stories within, whole, within the whole system. That food and water and shelter and clothing is difficult to get for a lot of folks. The way of life that the biblical prophets and teachers Faithful leaders call us to live means seeking out and following leaders who promote the values we know are important, we know are vital. The Torah, God's law, the writings of the prophets call upon God's people to see what the needy need. The needy are the biblical widow and orphan and promote the kinds of changes necessary so that everyone can work and live with dignity along other people, along with other people. Jesus called upon the Pharisees and other Jewish leaders of his day to pay less attention to the power they could keep and instead use their power to help. To be a person of faith doesn't mean that we always go along with our leaders out of a desire to keep the peace or not to stir up trouble. To be a person of faith means that we raise up those places that are evil, those places that are sinful, especially when the sin deprives people of what they need to live. We are called upon to live in such a way that doesn't create greater burdens for, pe for the poor, for the prisoner, for those whose lives are already in chaos. And we are called to participate in this democratic society in this representational republic to choose leaders that will move us toward a just society that treats all of its folks equitably and with empathy and understanding no matter who they are where they come from what their religious faith is or if they even have one let us live with a spirit of wisdom and hope let us be aware of others and see them with compassion. May we live to serve one another and be gracious as we are served when we are also in need. Amen.